Welcome to everybody that is joining. Uh, you are on the right channel, I believe, if you are a fellow of uh, Green Inclusive Finance and we give some minutes to people to join. Welcome to everybody, I see people are joining. Voila. So thanks for everyone that is joining. While we wait people to come in, um, I would like to welcome you. We are here to our um, bi-weekly session of uh, the Green Inclusive and Climate Smart Finance Action Group discussing together about Green Inclusive Finance. Um, today um, is quite uh, particular because we have the honor to have Afi with us that is gonna discuss a topic uh, that I think is quite important uh, for what we used to do in the action group and the green inclusive finance sector, both at practitioner level and the private sector level as well. This is about the role of regulation. Yeah, so we know that the regulation is developing quite fast, and uh, and uh, and I think it's a key moment that uh, we understand better what is the uh, the perspective of regulation for green inclusive finance, and uh, there is no better speaker then Joanna that's going to tell us about that um, uh, from the point of view of AFI and uh, its member. So uh, while people are joining let me give you the, the intro. So today we're going to speak about uh, uh, Green Inclusive Finance Regulatory Perspective. Uh, our speaker is Joanna that is with us uh, from AFI. Um, before going to the, uh, to the topic uh, as you know um, just a small introduction for the one that maybe does not know us. Um, the Green Inclusive and Climate Smart Finance Action Group, as you know, is a multi-stakeholder think tank based on the objective uh, uh, to this class topic uh, on green inclusive finance and responsible environmental finance, the current challenge and strategies, improve knowledge and action, enhance cooperation, increase international attention. And uh, one of the things I think is very important is develop common and dedicated tools, yeah, so that we can act together as a sector rather than individually. And once we do, to, public, to make publication and disseminate the fundings, uh, so to enhance the interest and concrete commitments, yeah, from microfinance institution up to uh, investor level. Uh, the, the group has quite some story. We've been funded in 2013. And since then, we've been expanding. Um, we have today around 150 members and more than 80 institutions that join us. You see some people here on, on this list. And as you see, it's really uh, what I think is unique. And if someone is in the audience is still not part of the action group and want to get involved, please just drop us an email. We really are inclusive in all sense. So we do not only deal with the green inclusive finance, but also we would like to include the majority of stakeholders to discuss together. So you see the mix between uh, university uh, consultant, international uh, institute, uh, private investor, uh, IT providers, uh, network of microfinance institution is coordinated by Natalia Realpe Carillo from EDERA and uh, EIS in Potsdam and by myself uh, from IAPO and SRMI. Um, some of the traction, yeah, thanks to you, the group has been expanded recently and we have more and more requirement to join. So again, please feel free to, to drop an email. Some of the activity we have been doing, as you know, yeah, um, we, have, we are working on the finalization of Greenest 3.0, I will say two words now uh, about that. Uh, we are working on the finalization of the Universal Standard for Environmental Performance as a joint work with the SPTF and the series. Uh, we are preparing training on the Guinness 3.0. I will say two words before giving the words to, to Joanna, as well as we are preparing a publication of the state of the art of green inclusive finance by putting together uh, basically around 1000 environmental assessment that we have been collecting from 2011 till 2019. Uh, some other work we're doing, as you see, is about digital and green inclusive finance. Uh, we have specific focus also in Europe as a different market than outside Europe. And uh, we are developing a group of green heroes by putting together financial service provider 
uh, that are recognized to have the best practices worldwide so that they can inform us on how to practically implement green inclusive finance on the, uh, in the field. Uh, please feel free to visit our new website yeah, that sees them to evolve in the next uh, uh, weeks and months. Uh, you will find quite a lot of information there. Still many are missing, uh, but for example, the webinar that you are going to listen today is, uh, is recorded and uh, you will find both the video and the uh, presentation there as other uh, material as, for example, we have just launched and again, please feel free to go through and look at that in online library by collecting information about green inclusive finance uh, by all public available documents. The idea is to make them grow and so to have a place where every uh, actor of green inclusive finance will feel that you want to drop a publication and that will be accessible, organized by argument. Yeah? So that's a common good for the food sector. Uh, the technology is empowered by uh, EDERA that has been designed this solution. Two words about the Greenest 3.0. Yeah, uh, before leaving the floor, I think it's a good moment to speak about that. Joanna is going to tell us the view about uh, regulation of green inclusive finance. Uh, uh, and some of you knows that we have been trying to build uh, this view uh, from practitioner side by basically building on the last 15 years of experience. The Greenest 3.0 is based, uh, is our last uh, small child. Yeah, <laughs> is the third version of an indicator has been making a bit the proof in the last seven years uh, and has been renewed uh, now, uh, taking into account uh, basically extensive uh, uh, um, work done in the field, both through projects, our partners, microfinance institution, and there's been a work that has been lasted one year to renew it, uh, basically involving around, uh, as you see below, uh, between 300 and 400 uh, stakeholders involved in this design. So thanks to everyone that has participated to the feedback, uh, to the conceptualization. Uh, the most interesting thing is that nowadays uh, uh, the Green Index uh, is basically extending the previous version we had. That was already the reference to assess environmental performance for microfinance institution uh, worldwide. And we have some improvement. First of all, is a mapping to alignment with international initiatives and standard regulation. Good point to discuss today as well. Uh, that was not the case before in the previous version. Uh, on top of that, there is a prominent inclusion of the dimension of vulnerability, vulnerability to climate change, vulnerability to uh, biodiversity losses. Again, that's, I think, is very radical. We're approaching uh, you know, the objective 2030. So it's very important to include this, uh, this dimension. Plus, together with our colleague from the Social Performance Task Force and the series, also 2021, that is the, the year of delivering uh, the Greenest 3.0, is also the year in which environmental performance enter as one of the key dimensions of social performance. So, um, as you will see, that was this evolution. And uh, together with our colleagues from SPTF and Series, we have been designed the environmental performance uh, uh, dimension of the social performance, and that will be mandatory uh, standard uh, uh, within SPTF and Series. And the two, of course, are aligned. Yeah, uh, so that we really uh, allow the sector to align it to work together. Uh, before giving the word to, to Joanna, just a reminder, this is part of the webinar series. That means uh, that is going to happen normally every two weeks. We will have a bit of a bumpy road in the next uh, uh, in the next uh, uh, weeks and months because there are a lot of events that are going to come. So the sum in Africa, we have an event in Central America from from Red Camif, uh, the, the three, four, and five about green inclusive finance in Central America. We have the sum for uh, for Africa. We have the European Microfinance Week. We have some other events about Europe. So there are quite some events. So basically, we will not be able to take the usual um calendar but normally we have a webinar every uh, two weeks if someone of you want to participate and provide the webinar uh, provide your experience just please uh, drop us an email we have two uh, versions one is 45 minutes actually it will be one hour and one is a short version of 15 minutes voila so now let's give the word to to joanna uh, please feel free to put your question into the chat into the question and answer uh, facility so that's at the end of the presentation john is going to speak for 25 30 minutes uh, we can uh, ask your question and have a long and nice debate joanna the floor is yours yes uh grazie mille davide that's really great as an introduction and thank you so much for having me here with you um I am, I'm delighted to be representing inclusive green finance from a regulator's perspective, more specifically from the Alliance for Financial Inclusion. 
So um, next slide, please. I think quite a number of you know who we are, the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, but I thought I'll take this opportunity also to share with you so you're aware that we are a network of financial regulators uh, from and central banks. Uh, so mostly central banks, uh, sometimes, uh, especially from Latin America, uh, superintendents, um, in some cases, finance ministries, uh, as, in, as well as in some cases, regulators of the insurance industry. So usually the, the institution in a country that has the main mandate to advance financial inclusion is the man member in AFI. And currently we have 102 members uh, from a total of 90 different countries. All of them are in developing and emerging economies, um, but from all over the globe. So we have regional initiatives in the Pacific, in Asia, in Eastern Europe, in Africa, and in, in Latin America, as well as in the MENA region. So that's where we're active, and, and this is who we are, basically. Next slide, please. And our ultimate goal is, is to create policy change. Um, it's a peer learning network where regulators come together to discuss with each other and learn from each other about financial inclusion, what works, what does not, what type of regulation or not regulation is needed. Uh, and, uh, and we have now been around, I dare say, for a total of 14 years, and it has proven uh, to be a very successful uh, concept. Next slide, please. Because this far in the network, we have recorded more than 500 policy changes uh, in 71 uh, countries having Maya de declaration commitments on financial inclusion and policy changes from a total of 90 different countries. So it's really about driving that change through discussion, through, through learning and through technical uh, support. So that is the basics of what the Alliance for Financial Inclusion is. Uh, and now I have the great pleasure of sharing with you our thoughts on inclusive green finance, as well as the AFI journey on this still relatively new uh, policy area. I'm aware that in the action group, you, you put the words uh, differently. Um, green inclusive finance, uh, it's, it's basically the same thing, but, but two different ways of saying it. So next slide, please. Um, and, and before we go into any of the discussions about regulation, about climate scenarios, about different types of risks. I think it's important with inclusive green finance really to remember that you have the human beings at the center of it all. And that's also what makes this policy area, as I think most of you know, so extremely relevant because so much of green finance discussions globally is about large scale mitigation. It's very much driven from a developed country perspective, which uh, which, uh, of course, there are reasons for this as well, and it's good that the discussion is moving forward. But it's also very important to remember that climate change is not only a, a technical question, it's about the human beings that are and will be impacted by climate change. And this is also at the core of inclusive green finance, how we can build the resilience of these individuals, of these MSMEs, of those people that are going to feel climate change the most amongst us all, how we can build that resilience through access to financial products and services. So throughout this presentation, please just keep in mind the, the individuals, uh, the human beings, because that's uh, as simple and as complicated as that. That's what we're doing here. Next slide, please. So we know indeed that the links uh, between climate change and financial stability, they are quite uh, clearly established by now. There's been a lot of work done by um, standard setting bodies and central banks in the past years. But what hasn't been explored as much is this position of vulnerable groups in all of this. So the, the simple argument is that there is a direct impact, negative impact from climate change and financial stability, but also there are financial stability impacts from social inequality and tensions. So financial inclusion in itself has impacts on financial stability. And of course, if we flip the coin the other way around, where we see that we build the resilience of the vulnerable populations, we financially include them, and we even take them on board on mitigation efforts as a part of being, a, you know, maybe even a driving force or a part of a just transition. That is where we can have a more resilient uh, and 
potentially carbon neutral economy, um, while it will also have positive impacts on, on financial stability. So I think it's important in all of this. Of course, you can also make the arguments from a human rights lens or from a kind of a environmental lens. But in all of this, of course, um, coming from a regulatory perspective, it's about also positioning inclusive green finance within the mandate of central banks, financial regulators. That mandate is primarily about price stability and then financial stability. In some cases, also about having a development mandate, of course, which expands it even further. But we can clearly establish that inclusive green finance is also within within the mandate of, of a fin financial stability mandate in most economies. Next slide, please. So this leads us to what we call inclusive green finance. Um, it's policies and regulation that aims at enabling mitigation and building resilience to the negative impacts of climate change through financial inclusion. As simple as that. Uh, next slide, please. And, and if we drill down a little bit into all of this, and I'm sure you're all familiar, um, it's about having access to savings, especially formal. It's about having access to green credit, having access to insurance, and more and more evidence is also showing that having access to adequate payment systems is something that builds resilience to the impacts of climate change, especially in the case of a natural disaster. So if we analyze them further, having access to formal savings, it's in indeed a buffer against cost increases. It's a way of diversifying risks. It's uh, assisting in accessing credit, but it can also be absolutely crucial when it's about um, rebuilding and having a recovery after an actual disaster. Credit is a very interesting one uh, when it comes to both greening and adaptation. It enables, of course, investments into low carbon technologies. It can assist in rebuilding efforts after natural disasters, but also it can result in investments into more resilient, for example, housing or more resilient agriculture practices. Of course, Green credit is not always simple. It's a question of how do you define green? I think we're going to be discussing that later on today as well. Uh, but it's also um, it's also a question of um, in what situation is actually credit the solution and ensuring that there's a sustainability in the system as well in terms of, of the financial situation of the individual. Insurance is very obvious here. There's a lot of developments happening in the last five to seven years on uh, climate risk insurance, all of the very interesting products that are indexed, indexed insurance products, uh, maybe even access to mobile phones. Um, and, and this is uh, something that is constantly being developed as well. And as I said, having even access to payment systems is proving to be very important when it comes to coping, especially with climate disasters, um, kind of slow onset, but more importantly, the fast onset disasters that really changes a life in, in a moment and then needing access to um, yeah, money to, to relocate or to rebuild and then payment systems can have a very important role to play in, for example, accessing capital from relatives or friends uh, or being able to receive government to person payments, for example. And, and this is also a link to a lot of the ongoing discussions on central bank digital currency, where I think maybe some of you followed the development and ongoing development of the sand dollar in the Bahamas, uh, where actually one of the underlying reasons why the sand dollar was developed was also to increase the climate resilience in a country like Bahamas, who is highly vulnerable to um, different uh, to natural disasters. And there is actually some very interesting background papers on that as well that is publicly available. So I would I would advise you all to also look into that connection because it's it's indeed a very big topic right now and, and there are links to financial inclusion obviously but also inclusive green finance in there and of course the underlying to all of this is digital financial services uh, it's not a, a category in itself but it is something that generally can advance and enhance inclusive green finance making it easier reaching the individuals um, and, and just maybe sometimes even being completely new ways of, of being financially included. Um, so uh, digital financial services is something we're currently looking into how it can be leveraged to really advance and enhance inclusive green finance. So this is the basics of all of it. I, I hope uh, in a way I know I preach to the choir, but in a way uh, I also needed to establish that. So we just start from the same point 
with these discussions. So I'll share a couple of examples with you how we approach it in the AFE network. And then on the very last slide, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time because I'm going to share with you what are the current trends, what are the developments, but also what are some of the challenges from a global perspective when it comes to inclusive green finance. And of course, at any point, if you have questions, um, please do share them in the chat box or raise your hand during the Q&A session. So next slide, please, David. So in the Alliance for uh, Financial Inclusion, we started the journey uh, back in 2017. There was a high level of recognition saying, uh, climate change will have a negative impact on the most vulnerable segments of the populations, meaning also having a negative impact on financial inclusion gains and efforts from the past years. But you flip the coin and you can see how financial inclusion can actually be a part of the solutions as well, empowering individuals to build their own resilience to the impacts of climate change, empowering in individuals to be a part of mitigation efforts, or maybe even empowering individuals and MSMEs to see the new business opportunities linked to climate mitigation and adaptation. That was 2017. There was a high level uh, political recognition. And then 2018, we started the project uh, with the very uh, generous support from the German Environment Ministry, uh, who are still working together with on this. And we started saying, OK, but in practice, what is this? How will the policies look? What are central banks currently doing? And because we are not an academic institution, so rather than going into the theories of things, we, we, uh, we talked to the members. Uh, the members spoke to each other and we saw a pattern evolving, which we call the four P's of inclusive green finance. And these are types of policies that central banks and financial regulators have put in place with regards to inclusive green finance. They are promotion, provision, protection and prevention. And I'll briefly, briefly talk you through all of them with examples as well from the national level. So next slide, please. And, and also while I speak, actually here, my colleague Majida uh, will be sharing some links to our recent publications. And one publication that is not so recent, that's called The Landscape of Inclusive Green Finance. Um, it's now a little bit more than a year old, but that, that still has a large portion of all the current projects. Uh, policies on inclusive green finance. So I think that can be of interest as well. So next slide, please. Yes, promotion. Um, first, it came out like one of the policies just as anything else. But the more we work with central banks, we see that promotion is the very first step. Central bank financial regulator, or I dare say most institutions who are going to engage in green finance need to take. It's about building the capacity within the regulator um, with other institutions on the national level of the financial service providers, maybe even um, also raising awareness or building the capacity on, on the demand side, so, um, so with the end users. Um, it is about uh, indeed raising the awareness and, and, and shifting the mindset to start off in the institution. Uh, but also in terms of, of actions, a central bank financial regulator can take and is taking, can take a very strong coordinating role on the national level put in place certain strategic goals, um, practice moral suasion, convene uh, the relevant stakeholders because of the mandate and the position of the financial regulator. This is, this is usually a, a strong possibility, but also putting in place frameworks for definitions and data collection. And, and Davide will get back to uh, the Green Index 3.0, I believe, uh, in our conversation as well shortly. So this is a, an important part as well. So the promotion are the very first step, step a regulator takes when engaging on, on inclusive green finance. We actually have a, a specific publication on this as well with examples from around the world. But some examples we see is, is for example, uh, the central bank in the Philippines has been appealing to commercial banks to recognize the business case for green lending. Um, and also BSP has been doing quite a lot of capacity building uh, and filling the knowledge gaps on green lending um, and investment for commercial banks and other financial institutions uh, through capacity building activities. Uh, Bank al Maghrib, which is a central bank in Morocco, um, they first encourage a voluntary approach by the banks uh, and sensitize them to the financial sector to the benefits uh, of sustainable development and the risks of climate change. Um, and it has also supported training green finance with the Moroccan Bank Banking Association. We have loads of these examples. We have, uh, as AFI also conducted trainings in Bhutan, in uh, supported South American Principe, in Eswatini, 
in Ecuador, in Mongolia. Uh, but really the first step is about changing mindset and building capacity uh, and establishing the frameworks. Uh, next slide, please. Then we come to provision policies, uh, which is indeed a lot also linked to, to access to green credit. Um, and um, yeah, mostly access to, to green credit. Um, green can, of course, it's important to, to think about what is the definition of green? Is it only mitigation? Probably not. Mitigation and adaptation? Uh, probably yes. Uh, is there also biodiversity within that green definition? And this is, of course, well, the, where taxonomies that are being currently developed in a number of countries are so extremely important. Uh, we see some cases where regulators have put in place lending quotas, such as Bangladesh Bank, who has a, a quota in place saying that uh, the goal is that 5% of all uh, banks uh, should lend, five, uh, yeah, 5% of all lending from commercial banks should be um, going to green purposes. And they listed out these green purposes, 52 of them as well. Um, and uh, refinancing for recovery and reconstruction. This is similar mechanisms we've seen across the globe uh, being put in place for, for COVID-19 <laughs> recovery and reconstruction, uh, but similar can be put in place after a natural disaster. Uh, refinancing green lending specifically, uh, but also we see some cases of innovation investments fund, and of course, a number of other financing schemes that are not really regulation or central bank policy, but where the central bank or financial regulator would also be an implementing. So these are provision policies. Um, then the next one is protection policies. And protection policies are quite different because um, the aim of protection policies is to reduce financial risks by socializing potential losses through insurance, credit guarantees, social payments, or any other related risk sharing mechanisms. Uh, and this is to provide a safety net and to build the resilience um, by accelerating and facilitating recovery from extreme climate events. So climate risk insurance is a very clear one, how it functions, why it's there. Uh, credit guarantees is a very interesting mechanism that is indeed in place in a number of countries. We're just about to publish a report on how credit guarantees schemes could be potentially tailored for inclusive green finance purposes, because Currently, there's not loads of them that are actually both inclusive and green, meaning green for MSMEs. Uh, but we also see in a couple of policies like withdrawal from pension funds related to disasters and mobile money payments, government to persons um, payments after a disaster. So this is a very, uh, it's a very different type of policies, but we definitely see them emerging as well. Then the fourth and last uh, category, uh, next slide, please is what we call prevention policies. And this was the kind of weird kid on the block that we added last and is gaining a lot of, of uh, traction currently globally. And it's about putting in place environmental and social risk management guidelines. And these are there in order to address um, the social and environmental externalities and risks of a financial institution's activities. So usually related to credit decisions, uh, there is, um, very clear guidance on what type of activities um, or what type of assessment should be done for certain activities before a decision is made. Most of these that are in place currently are um, voluntary um, ESRM guidelines. Uh, there is one that is uh, compulsory in Brazil, and there's also currently a number of updates ongoing amongst other things uh, in, in Nepal. Um, so these are very interesting uh, guidelines. And of course, it establishes kind of a baseline ensuring that no, no decisions are made that should further harm the environment or, or have negative um, social consequences. Of course, a big concern here is also to ensure that such environmental social risk management guidelines do not further lead to, uh, lead to further financial exclusion so that, uh, that people will still have access to finance even if they are in very vulnerable situations. So these are our four P's of inclusive green finance. Uh, and this is the moment where we move forward. So we get to the meat of the trends and the current situation in the world. This is our journey on inclusive green finance. And I basically already told you mostly of it. Um, so just the, the thing that is important to tell you is that we actually have a working group on inclusive green finance in AFI. 
So that is 49 regulators from a total of 44 different countries who are especially interested in this topic that come together and talk about the topic, share with each other, and then provide also regulatory guidance and, and policy leadership on this specific topic through the knowledge products I've been sharing, but also through in-country implementation support. Otherwise than that, uh, let's move forward to the next slide, please. So this is just uh, basically what I just said. Um, inclusive green finance for regulators is a quite new topic. So we started 2017, properly 2018, and we really kicked off with launching the four P's 2019, as well as the working group coming into place 2019. Uh, but we already have uh, a couple of policy changes, more coming in, uh, and we have really a big interest from members on this specific topic, uh, which of course is, is mirrored across the globe when it comes to the interest in green finance. So next slide, please. And, and this is what we do in AFI. We support uh, members in, in generating knowledge through a knowledge product. We build capacity and we also support with, with in-country implementation. Um, very good. Next slide, please. And this is really, I think, the meat of what I want to tell you. So this is the current trends and considerations. The, the, the journey we're currently seeing uh, in emerging within institutions when it comes to working on green finance starts with a shift of mindset uh, resulting in awareness raising, uh, capacity building of staff of those uh, institutions around of uh, FSPs, but also um, of, uh, of the demand side, um, assessing potentially the climate vulnerability of the country, mapping environmental related risks to the financial system, um, and mapping out what are the existing policies and frameworks in place on the national level, maybe not green finance, but green related. What are the NDCs? What are the national adaptation plans? What are the current commitments of that specific country? Then leading to national level dialogue and collaboration. And after that, um, to the development of taxonomies and definitions. I believe we also have a question on the taxonomies in the chat. Uh, and green, uh, so definitions of what green finance really is what is really inclusive green finance in order to be able to develop specific products and services as well. Then adopting, uh, adapting existing policies and regulation um, or developing new policies to advance inclusive green finance. And after that, usually considering to develop and put in place environmental and social risk management frameworks. In all of this, um, I'm, I'm personally very uh, excited about the possibility we have that it's such a new policy area. Um, and we can build in gender considerations from the start. Because a lot of the time we know that gender, there's policy and then you know, gender comes as an afterthought because there are clearly a, a inequalities in the implementation or there are consequences you didn't think about from a gender perspective. Inclusive green finance is new, relatively. Green finance is quite new. And we know also that women are more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So now it's really uh, up to us to also ensure uh, that in any inclusive green finance policies, there's also a gender component. And maybe not always, not in all policies, it's relevant, in some it is. And then also important that it's not only gender neutral, but gender transformative. So it can actually advance gender inclusive finance as well. Another area we're working on is to better understand digital financial services and inclusive green finance. What's out there? What type of regulation is needed? Is the regulation hands-off? Is the regulation hands-on? Is it dialogue? what type of, of incentives or regulation is needed from the regulators to ensure that DFS can in the best way advance inclusive green finance. And of course, data, data gathering. And I believe we have a couple of questions on this as well, David, so I can, I can share more on that shortly. Um, there's also a lot of work going on with standard setting bodies and to elevate inclusive green finance to the standard setting bodies is also one priority. Um, and of course, inclusive green finance and green finance in the recovery um, and reconstruction during and after COVID-19 is, is also paramount. We haven't seen that much of it yet, uh, but I believe there's quite a number of initiatives underway as well on, on this area. So uh, this is, is my the gist of my presentation. Um, I, I think maybe, David, we could take a couple of questions and, and then move it on from there. Super. So first of all, thanks a lot. Yeah, I also see that part of the question there are a lot of congratulations. So I will join to congratulate for the important work you're doing. And uh, before opening the floor to the question here below, I cannot stop to ask uh, um, 
two questions, I think, um, that is very near, I think, to all the members, at least of the action group. One is uh, how can we make it operational all that? And in particular, what kind of tools uh, you as a coordinator of central banks, a regulator, or your members are looking for, you know, to support the construction of this taxonomy? So what is green and what is, what is not green? Uh, and what is current and what is expected or desirable to have? You're mute. Yes, I am. Clearly, it's getting late in Kuala Lumpur. Um, this is a, a really, a really good question. And I think a question that so many institutions and individuals and researchers are currently grappling with globally, because I think if there's one thing we all have in common is that we, we lay at, uh, at night awake thinking about how to construct taxonomies, seems to be the, the one thing currently going on. Um, what we, of course, uh, work on is the inclusive element. So it's not the large scale, it's not the capital markets, it's not green bond definitions. It's really what does green products and services mean for MSMEs primarily, but maybe even to some extent, or to some extent for individuals and MSMEs. We're engaging in a couple of projects with members on this. Um, we're also developing knowledge, some type of principles on it. But I think a couple of learnings we had so far is uh, we need to be able to, to, of course, standardize to some extent, but every single national context is different. Uh, what needs to be also leading a guidance in this is uh, nationally, na nationally determined contributions, because what we need to build into a green taxonomy is not only kind of an eternal definition of what is green, but it's also about how to move the needle towards a greener society. Um, of course, it needs to be heavily evidence-based. Uh, and we, we all know that it's also a very political question. So that's also why it's important to have the appropriate uh, consultation and participatory mechanisms around it, while still also ensuring that the decisions are taken without, um, for example, the influence of, of specific business interests. So these are some of the considerations we know already now, people are talking about. Um, but, but beyond that, I can't, I can't share any principles with you. We will definitely share them when we have them in place. And I, I think a lot of things are happening in tandem on this specific topic. So, so we're looking forward to seeing these taxonomies take shape. And of course, we're also very closely following the, the social taxonomy being uh, developed in Europe. Uh, in, by the EU, because this is also something that will be very interesting from kind of an inclusive uh, perspective for moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And um, and before yeah, before going to the to the floor question, I also again I think I'm bringing a question from at least from the members of our group. As you know, we have been quite working for a while on this uh, green index topic to really try to make this exercise to standardize, uh, uh, at least to standardize, to provide the, the say common framework rather than standardize uh, what green inclusive finance is. And our approach has been, let's say on the other side of, or let's say of the approach you used to follow. So starting you know, from the ground, what has been happening and then try to give a form uh, that is operational. And that's how we build this green index. Then it's been evolved for a while. And uh, I know you and some of your members have been part on the review of the Green S3.0. And clear the question that uh, uh, many uh, that participated from our action group uh, will have is uh, what could be the role of this green index uh, from a regulatory perspective? Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Davide. Um, yes, uh, I think it's uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you with the work you're doing and, and the work you've been doing for a long time, because this is indeed 3.0. <laughs> it's a very few uh, indexes or, you know, benchmarks related to green finance that you can actually say this is 3.0. Usually it's, it's version 0 0.5 that is ongoing. So, so first of all, congratulations on that. And, and also we really appreciate the approach you had, um, you know, casting your, your net very wide, ensuring that there's uh, participation, consultation and inputs from a wide, uh, a wide, wide audience and different actors. From a regulator's perspective, what already happened um, last year is actually the, the Financial Regulatory Commission of Mongolia, uh, one of the members in the AFI network. They were working a lot with the MBFIs in the country on um, building their capacity on green lending for MSMEs, generally greening their practices. Uh, a lot of it was capa a capacity building project that we were doing uh, from, from the Alliance for Financial Inclusion Management Unit um, together with, with FRC Mongolia. And actually they used the green index, not 3.0, but the 2.01, as a basis 
uh, for a specific questionnaire that they surveyed. Uh, I can't remember the exact, exact number, but a large number of MBA advice in the country to understand, uh, use it as a baseline for how green uh, the MBFIs actually are uh, in, in the Mongolian context. And then after that, they had the training and could then build on, on that and kind of know, know where they are. So, uh, of course, it's always up to the national context um, that is clear. And it's always up to the specific uh, approach and preference uh, and, um, and uh, strategic uh, direction of the specific regulators as well. Uh, but I think this is a very good case of how the Green Index can be used to establish a baseline and maybe then it could be used in further iterations as well to, to benchmark uh, the specific institutions against. Um, so that's, my, uh, that's my, my two cents on the use of the Green Index. I just wanted to get back to you, David, on the first question with taxonomies. I think it's also quite important and, and really interesting what we've seen uh, a first regulator from the network, the Reserve Bank of Fiji, actually did a demand side survey uh, amongst the population of Fiji, focusing on especially women, uh, but, but asking the questions, how would you prefer to cope, um, kind of at, what kind of financial products and services would help you cope after a natural disaster? Or do you currently have access to these and these and these products and services? And in case of a natural disaster, would you use them? And really understanding the preferences of the population um, from the vulnerable communities of how access to financial products and services would actually assist them and what types of services could be developed to assist them in the case of both gradual and, um, and kind of fast onset climate change. And I think that's also something to consider when we define green in the national context, because especially when it comes to adaptation, it's very difficult to say that this is adaptation in our national context. Sometimes it goes down to a very granular level. And no matter what, it's important that those vulnerable communities that are actually those that need to adapt the most and will have the biggest challenges will actually also be heard in that process. And I think this type of survey is very, very interesting, for example, as well feeding into national definitions. And again, I know I'm speaking about this from a very different perspective, because usually a taxonomy is just like large scale mitigation. But from the adaptation side, we need to be a little bit more creative, but also a lot more inclusive in the process leading up to it. So sorry for jumping back and forth, but I think this example from Fiji is a, is a very interesting one. Thanks a lot. Now I, I very appreciate and also would like to appreciate and now I open to the question our participant posted on the chat and the question and answer. But I think I would like to add that I very appreciate um, uh, from one side the fact that uh, there is clearly focus on building resiliences. That is clearly an evolution of what has been considered as green before, you know, just to not harm the environment. And also what is very nice is uh, I would believe that uh, without basically connecting before, I mean, before we started the work on the Green 3.0, we were on the same trajectory because the Green 3.0 is exactly um, built on the consciousness that if you work with inclusive, with, let's say, with poor or excluded population, the building of resilience is, and trying to assess and, and decrease the vulnerability is the key entry point for Green Inclusive Finance. And I'm pleased that the Green 3.0 has exactly this main dimension put relevant um, that I think is so important for the inclusive finance sector. So going to questions, uh, so there are some questions about taxonomy, I said uh, one by Raguram uh, Bodupali that uh, tell us of, about if you have developed any standard green taxonomy which would address the, uh, uh, the need among financial market participants in what is understood and what qualifies green finance. Here I think is basically translate also into main concept. Is there a standard to whom we, uh, to which we can expire? And do you have concrete example where some countries inspire and generate its own taxonomy? Yes, I, I'm, um, I think it's very clear that uh, when it comes to taxonomies, there's no one solution fits all. Uh, it's clear that when we see, look at the standard or the green taxonomy in EU, it's not something that can be implemented easily in other parts of the world because the, the buildup of the economy, the specific vulnerabilities, also the, the, the different emissions but also the national targets are, are very different so i wouldn't say that uh, that there is kind of one standard to follow uh, but um, i see that there is a lot of developments happening in this topic globally um, we, there's a very 
very interesting taxonomy that has been published, uh, approved, and is u- being used in Mongolia, a collaboration between a number of different regulators. And that one I find very interesting also because it actually defines a couple of activities that are seen as green that are actually targeted for MSMEs. Um, so that is also going beyond only the large-scale mitigation. I can see there's a question from, from John uh, Myshak in the question and answer exactly saying that, that a lot of the current taxonomies are focusing on large-scale mitigation, which is so badly needed currently, uh, but they are not very much focusing on individuals and MSMEs, which is also a part of the green finance package. Um, and, and that's definitely something that we're working on with a couple of regulators. I can't, I can't mention them, them here right now, but there are policies being developed. And in terms of standards, we're also working for, for that with the network. And again, for us, standards is a very strong word. Like, it's not saying this is the way you do it, but sharing examples of how it can be done, different type of taxonomies or definitions that work for different types of economies, and, and also uh, a little bit of a methodology, maybe how, how some of the main issues can be tackled. So thanks a lot. I was looking for my button to unmute myself. And also, yeah, I think we, we are also, we're also answering one of the two questions by John um, that I think is a key point. So maybe again, a bit elaborating into that. So what is your perception um, that this regulation that typically are built or this taxonomy, you know, at macro level, as you said, is so important, can be triggered down the inclusive level. And what do you think are the, uh, the needed changes? You know, because one of the work we've been doing in the Green Inclusive Finance Action Group is exactly to say, okay, what makes sense for the peculiar clients of a financial institution, a microfinance or bank providing services to SMEs, uh, that can still be classified as green. So there is quite a lot of work, uh, as many of the policy develop. You, know, you can also you can speak about many, is to be focused on the concrete target. So how do you see this work? Is it a work that is ongoing in parallel to develop a taxonomy, or would we need first that there is a taxonomy in place, then we make it we make it trickle down, or we will follow up basically the inspiring word you said before? We are starting, and why not including from scratch gender? Yeah, before thinking, ah, there were is not really gender equal, and then we correct. So that's sort of similar for the inclusive finance. What what do you think is an approach that you the various approaches you are seeing? And what will make sense? Yeah, I, I think it's it's really, I mean, I can't stress enough the national context. And of course, when we, we look at, um, I mean, it also depends on what the, what is the, the interest from the national context. And so many members in the AFI network, you see the concrete um, impact of climate change on the ground amongst the vulnerable populations. And that's, of course, also when you have a very strong incentive to say, okay, how can we build the resilience amongst these populations? And one step to reach that goal is also to define what resilience or adaptation means in the national context, meaning basically adding it into a taxonomy. For those those economies, and, and here I dare say, for example, the European Union, of course, adaptation is extremely important. Uh, but when we look at the policy goal of, of sites, uh, the policy side of things, of course, the, the really big push has been on mitigation. Uh, I mean, having said that, of course, still uh, we have a, a adaptation side also to the EU taxonomy, um, but they're really the focus is on the large scale because it's about uh, achieving large scale impact and making a dent in climate change. When it comes to smaller countries with more vulnerable populations, uh, mitigation is important, but adaptation and resilience building, especially of MSMEs individuals might be a a higher priority. So that's also where it, it might be reflected and something I see when I talk to members, especially with very vulnerable populations, this is a, a, a priority as well. Thank you, Joanna. So I'm going to take a question from uh, Lucia Spaggiari from Microfinanza Rating that is telling us, first of all, congratulations. Dear Joanna, thanks a lot for the very interesting points. Much appreciated. Here is Lucia Spaggiari and Marco Bianchi from Microfinanza Rating, Microfinance, Microfinance Rating Institute, the rate microfinance institution. Will you be so kind to uh, please uh, also share the thinking of AF in terms of uh, integrating environmental risk management, prevention, provision, capital requirement? in prudential regulation to avoid financial institutions engaging in practice that may be too risky and pose problem on financial stabilities. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you very much. I think that is an extremely important point. And this is the 
the thing I was alluding to a little bit as well when it came to to the green credit. Um, I think this is something that all the regulators in the network, of course, are very aware of and highly also prioritizing, ensuring that uh, you know there will there, this will not be a, a fundamental risk also to financial stability in the country or for specific segments uh, of the population. Um, and, and and I think that's why we need to be quite careful when we define green in specific purposes, because we see this massive push from the highest levels of pushing also capital towards green purposes uh, right now. But we need to ensure that these are the right pathways for adaptation and for mitigation, and it doesn't uh, necessarily exacerbate uh, the risks uh, related to these specific um, this, this specific um, activities. Of course, what is what makes it more complicated right now is when we talk about risks and climate change, we see two different types of risks. We see the physical risks, which are the physical impacts of climate change and how that, that creates very real risks. Of course, we don't know exactly. We cannot measure them precisely throughout all countries, all places. There are also unexpected events, uh, but we have likelihoods that we know specific climate vulnerabilities of specific regions. But we also have what you call transition risks. So that is when policies are being developed, there will, of course, also be implications on the market from these specific policies. So, for example, a transition policy saying that we will phase out the use of, of coal power will, of course, lead to uh, maybe in the, in the short term more expensive uh, uh, electricity prices, but also those assets that are currently put into coal gen uh, energy generated by coal will, will in the end be stranded assets. So this is, of course, also important to be aware of the specific risks in the country context. And that is why the national level coordination and dialogue is so extremely important, because in order to also know the transition risks, that's where the regulator has, has such an important uh, role to also play when it comes to, to ensuring that there is no such um, or as little as possible of the risky behavior. Thanks a lot, Joanna. So I take a, a, a question from Hurken from the from the SPTF. Uh, what is your impression about the European SFDR and the equivalent work uh, on of regulators in the South? So we heard quite a lot here in Europe of SSDR, how that is impacting um, also inclusive finance investor here and the possible their investment uh, in the South. So what is your impression? Yes, here I need to say that I'm definitely not a, an expert. Uh, in, in this specific regulation and standard. Um, I, I, of course, I, if, I, if you allow me, Jürgen, to slightly sidestep your question, because otherwise I might be engaging in a conversation where I'm not 100% comfortable. Uh, but what we see, of course, is now a, a will to put standards and also to, to create very you know, specific frameworks around green finance. Um, and we need, and, and in all of these processes, it's so important to ensure that there is a participation across the globe into setting these standards because of course also a green taxonomy from the eu will highly impact uh, a number of other countries across the globe um but but as with any other reporting standards or or anything like that that is developed and and i also see that there are risks of course for you know leading to financial exclusion but also potentially highly affecting the cost of capital for specific countries if these standards are very much uh, driven from from specific uh, national interests or from specific perspectives. Uh, that, that's as much as I can say at this specific moment. Thank you. So thanks a lot, Joanna. Um, I think there is a very interesting point from uh, Rugaman Badupali again. I think, uh, you know, if you want to transit toward a more greener economy or society, you know, broadly, as well as try to build resiliences, uh, you know, there are various ways to do and one, of course, is to provide, provide those incentives. Yeah. The question is, do you have any good example of central bank regulation which incentivizes institutions or clients to adopt green finance? So what is incentive scheme uh, you have been seeing or is it or is a tool that central banks are looking into that to support this transition or, or not? Yes, no, thank you. That is of course the one-on-one question. Because uh, also we see a strong preference from a number of regulators to ha put incentives in place rather than to um, rather than to to regulate. Um, of course, the the very strong tool I already mentioned that is at the disposal of central banks is the moral suasion. So so indicating that this will this is of importance to the country and this will be also seen in regulation and standards uh, down the line. 
and and we've seen this far that this has uh, had a good impact for example in morocco in in the philippines in thailand so this kind of moral suasion and leadership from from the financial regulator or central bank is, is quite powerful but we also see other types of of incentives quite recently we saw any uh, quite large initiatives by the central bank of egypt uh, where they made available um, uh, basically at lower interest rates capital for on lending uh, to um, specific purposes both resilience building within agriculture and mitigation measures uh, amongst others within uh, for, for vehicles but also uh, in bakeries uh, so this is definitely also something we see um, similar things um, the credit risk uh, guarantee schemes we've seen in, in ghana in nigeria these are quite interesting um, also to explore for other green purposes and, and that's also a type of incentive uh, that is put in place um, in order to, to ensure that there is access to capital. So there are quite a number of them, but I would really say that the one that we see across a number of institutions right now is, is kind of moral suasion, thought leadership, uh, capacity building and having that national dialogue also encouraging um, towards green, green activities, green behavior, uh, but also green, green products and services. Thanks, Joanna. So I take another question from John um, that is posing a, a very relevant uh, topic. So suppose now we start moving our economies toward green, as said, but uh, again, as about taxonomy, what green is. So we are clearly exposed to a quite a risk of greenwashing. Yeah. So uh, transonom, tax, sorry, economy need to transit for finance to finance it, or you have financial incentive to transit. So and then there is clearly a risk of greenwashing while you do. So question here is uh, what step do you think should be put in place to prevent greenwashing? Policy are just a start. We can already see in developed economy a tendency to exaggerate the green and inclusive impact of financial institution activities. Regulators in most developing countries certainly don't have the capacity to validate the ESG environmental social government performance and reporting uh, of the financial institution. So one part could be a voluntary greenwashing, let's say. The other could be just because you don't have the capacity to really understand, and so you try to to adapt what you do. So, what's your opinion on this risk of greenwashing? Yes, no, thank you so much, John. Um, I'll 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 answer the first part of your question. The latter part, I I don't know what examples you're exactly referring to here, or or the the statement towards the end of your question is not necessarily something that I would subscribe to. Um, I'm going to bring in a little bit of myself here. I'm, I'm originally a biologist uh, and, uh, and I remember throughout my studies and, and also academic uh, research time on climate science, there was an eternal discussion on you know, what is green and what is not. Uh, and the discussion there can go quite deep and to the level of if I wash this carton of uh, yogurt uh, and recycle it, is it more green than if I uh, don't use the water to wash it and I just throw it away into the trash. So this is a, a very simple and stupid example, but I just want to highlight that the green, of course, there is certain things that are good for the environment and bad for the environment, but everything is also a sliding scale. And what is perceived as greenwashing also comes from the perspective of the person that is watching. This is not to disregard your question and not to say that this is extremely important. Um, this is not an important uh, topic and I can see the link you watch, uh, you, you just shared. This is so important that we talk about greenwashing. I just want to add this nuance into the, into the, the conversation. The one thing I can say is that what is so important, and this is why so many regulators are starting with capacity building, national level coordination and dialogues, is to ensure that, uh, that there is the capacity, one, in the financial institutions to engage, pro engage properly in green finance, but also within the regulator themselves. And that is not only in terms of putting the policy in place and, and, and putting it to the side, but also ensuring that there is supervision capacity and, and, and also uh, at some point there will be need for, for updating regulations, etc. So this is a really a massive capacity issue, as, as I think you're also pointing out in your of uh, in in your question uh, and and something that I feel sometimes with green finance it's so urgent that we're moving very fast sometimes because we have to but I think really supervision and uh, 
supervision of, of green finance regulation is something that is really on the horizon and something that is so important if we want to do this properly. Thank you. And um, yeah, time is running against us, but I think, uh, yeah, again, John have a question that I think makes a lot of sense to, to have as a last question, because of course we're speaking about green, yeah, uh, but also there are things that are not green, yeah. So, and then uh, beyond, you know, having incentive to move toward greens, what are the disincentive to don't keep on doing things that are not green? So what's about the taxonomy for non-green things, as well as this operationalization? And, uh, and what is your thought about that? Yeah. Um, yes, that's, that's splendid. Um, and of course, I think many of you know the debates between the EU green taxonomy, there was a lot of discussions on green and brown or light green or deeper green, or you know, how do we qualify and uh, or how do we define all of these different shades? Uh, but I think uh, one, uh, one example I want to bring forward is indeed on the ESRM guidelines, I think that's a good start to kind of establish the bottom of everything, and and link to that also environmental and uh, environmental impact assessments and and strategic environmental assessments that are a practice in so many countries, but could also very easily be integrated with specific credit decisions, and that is 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 basically a you know a, a potential yes no if certain projects can go ahead or not. Um, and that can also be integrated into to the decision on the credit side of things. So I think that's that's really something that needs to be put in place. Um, other than that, uh, we don't see that much currently of the kind of penalizing the brown. It's more about incentivizing, encouraging, um, you know, advancing the green. Um, but I think here uh, there's also quite a lot of movement in public opinion and, and really a lot of... Um, you know, movements on, on the side of, of human beings. And I, I, I maybe think I, I need to end by saying um, I've been quite disillusioned for quite a number of years working with climate policies because uh, whatever report comes out, it's we're more closing, closer and closer to, to quite, uh, you know, difficult situations. And of course, climate change is, is marching forward with very a very fast pace. Uh, we see a lot of suffering around the globe because of climate change. Uh, environmental degradation but what i've been experiencing in the last months the last half year is really a massive mobilization and movement around especially climate mitigation we really see and and you know and and this is not only amongst policymakers we see it also amongst ordinary human beings and awareness a willingness to put uh, some personal gains aside and here i think we we definitely need to look very much at the younger generation so so not even us, us millennials, but Generation Z, uh, they are doing an amazing job in really showing us what are what is the right way forward. Uh, and there, I, I think in many of the younger generation, there's a built-in understanding that there's a lot of what we would say brown assets, but brown behavior as well in terms of, of behavior that would be harming the environment, contributing to climate change is something shameful or something that, that should be avoided um, if possible. Uh, so, so here, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that, yes, of course, we need to look at how to have a full transition where you incentivize, but also ensure that behavior that harms the environment contributes to climate change or social injustice is, is not further um, advanced and encouraged. But I think also there is great hope in, in humanity in terms of taking its responsibility, especially amongst the younger generations, and that those kind of ESRM guidelines somehow are are a little bit built into them that are have been growing up with climate change throughout their lives. So on that slightly softer note, mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question, John, as well. So thanks a lot, Joanna. I think it's also brown uh, where you are, so it's getting toward, uh, toward night. So <laughs> we are pleased to leave you go to sleep. And uh, I would like, first of all, to very much acknowledge and thanks uh, your very precious presence here. I think you um, you put the bar quite high. Um, the work done at the level of regulation is so important um, and is even more important when done in synergies with what is happening in operation. So we really have uh, a lot of uh, work to go through uh, as uh, your action group, uh, your working group, sorry, our action group, etc., to try to build bridges. That at least is my is my understanding. You know how to translate regulation into practices, how to translate practices into regulation, how to build bridges so that, as you said, 
we clearly have this common ship where what is brown and what is green uh, and that regulation just become a common sense of what should be done for the greater good. Um, so thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the participant, for all the brilliant uh, questions. Thanks for Joanna. Thanks to the full AFI and the members for the participation. As you know, this webinar has been recorded, so you can uh, look at it again on the Action Group website, as well as this PPT you will find there online. You can also share, of course, with your network uh, where needed. And uh, please uh, uh, remember, we'll contact with you next for uh, the uh, next webinar. I will also would like to state, uh, if I did not stress enough, uh, that the Greenest 3.0 uh, will be released very soon together with the Dimension 7 Universal Performance for the environment. And we will get in through organization of trainings, both to our members, but also to the sector and with specific focus on training in Spanish, French and English to financial service provider and doing together data collection. So we didn't speak too much about data. Uh, that will be another topic. Um, so to support the data collection for financial intermediaries or what we're doing, how we're doing, et cetera, to the green industry point zero. So stay tuned. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks a lot for your participation. Thanks for the engagement to everyone to build a more uh, equal and fair and green society. Thanks to everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care.